teachable um, that hopefully you, you've had a chance to have a look at. And so the next section is really about showing how different clients and customers and companies have helped that innovation and what, what are some things that you can take away to augment your offering, the way that you communicate, um, the way that you connect, as Sinead was saying. I think the other thing is there's some evidence to say that those companies that are sort of investing and if you like doubling down on the things they do invest in are getting a great return. So it's sort of challenging that mindset of, uh, you know, rather than just surviving, how do you thrive in this environment and where do you put that investment? And the last section, which is probably the most um, important at the moment is gathering those insights so that you can make better decisions for your customers. And I'm going to show you some examples. So we're going to go through that. It's quite packed, <laughs> but I'll, I'm trying to simplify it as much as I can. But any of those extra documents or resources will sit in Teachable. And of course, I'll direct you to that after, after this um, webinar. So let's get into it. I know there's quite a bit on this page, but I wanted to just touch through it and then perhaps ask if you've noticed any trends. This is me going through and basically collecting from all the thought leaders what has changed in our environment and perhaps how can we take advantage of it. And on the next slides, I'm going to show you how some companies have done that. So we all know that there's more flexible workspace. You know, a lot of us are working remotely as we did a poll last time. Um, you would have seen perhaps some of you, the screening of temperature as you're walking into retail stores. Um, definitely the hand sanitizers everywhere now. Um, so there's some real trends that are changing the way that we shop and the way we work. I think that um, that creates some opportunity for businesses in just acknowledging that and seeing how their product um, if or service adapts to these trends. Um, so, so there's a couple in the first two. Um, also the privacy and data protection is coming up and we, we would have, you would have heard that with the app um, discussion. So companies that deal in that data space and privacy are, and you know I think we've got a couple in technology that's a bit of a hot spot at the moment so that's creating another um, opportunity to talk about services in that space. Um, it's also a time I guess where you can do some experiment, um, experimentation around what's going to work and what's not. Um, so, you know, being aware of um, how to do that is taking advantage of some of these trends. And um, so there are some companies that are using technologies to actually create a better um, employee or customer experience. And I'll show you that as we go through. We've always known that the mobile was a big space and that we've you know, now got not only the rise of that in terms of communications, I mean, how many of you are now getting text messages of sales and things that perhaps you weren't getting, you know, even two or three years ago. So that's continuing and it's ramped up somewhat, but also the use of these machines, artificial learning and smart automation. automation. Um, so all of these things have now moved from a certain sphere, particularly in retail and banking, and some of you may have seen, you know, even in um, Wuhan, they had, you know, robots delivering food and some of the hotels have taken that on as well as um, some cleaning. So we're definitely seeing that, but we're seeing that move into the general business sphere as well. Um, have any of you seen any of these things or can acknowledge any of these trends that I've mentioned so far. If you want to take yourself off mute, um, please do so. <laughs> so 
yeah, look, I'm sure that you have. Um, it's just how does that apply to your business? So we'll, we'll keep moving on. Um, Daniel, can I, can yeah, can sure. I just make a point here? Um, yeah. I'm sure you all know what a SWOT analysis is, but I have a sort of a different one. It has two T's and the last T is around trends because if you actually capture the trends like these or the ones specifically that impact your business, it impacts through to your SWOT analysis and particularly things like your weaknesses, your strengths, weaknesses and, and the opportunities particularly. So if you just think of it in those terms, it's just a good way to, to rejig your strategy um, and, you know, maybe look at that in, in, in conjunction with the business model canvas as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and look, some of these trends are here to stay and some of them will disappear. I think this DIY is a big trend and you'll see that across lots of things just because we can't get access to gyms and even if they open up, there's still that fear factor. So doing things for yourself, we've seen a big rise in um, well, Bunnings share price, as I think I discussed last time, because of that DIY trend. Um, and also in terms of apps, you know, just like this Zoom app um, and collaboration apps are now, people are trying to find smarter ways to communicate. So from a tech space and a retail space, I think there's some trends that everyone can um, jump on board with. Let's have a look at actually what's um, happening in the space. Um, there's a couple more here. Um, the internet of things, that's what that means, is actually a connection of lots of different smart devices. Um, and this is important because, you know, not only hospitals, but now spaces are trying to use things that allow for minimal touch um, and make that social distancing protocol even more effective. Um, you know, remote schooling and the use of webinars and um, tutoring and teaching, that's become a big thing as well. And even within, um, I think I was talking to Ken last night, I was doing a video interview for some coaching for RMIT and that was all done through a tool that asked me to respond in video rather than do an interview. Um, so it's infiltrating, I guess, every space. Um, this 3D printing is definitely a, a now sort of even more of a trend. Um, but there's some simple sort of comfort ones. And um, Sinead, you referred to this just in terms of, you know, how people feel on that emotional side um, that, you know, businesses and brands can take advantage of. So for example, bonds, you know, acknowledge we're all working from home or many of us are, and so how can we be comfortable? So using what we know as trends and applying it to our business. There's a couple more um, lush, which, you know, have a lot of soaps and, and, and homemade craft and cosmetics have got this self-timing soap. I don't know if many of you have seen it, but basically by the time you use it and it totally dissolves, um, you'll have done that 30 second in terms of cleaning. So really leveraging the fear factor, but also something useful um, to develop another product that could have a niche following. So um, other things like virtual pods and space in terms of the um, construction industry and how they now um, cater for the way that we need to work is also creating these virtual pods and barriers. Um, and you would have seen that in shopping centres now having, um, and shops now having dividers between you and the, and the cash register or till. Any others that anyone's seen in terms of trends um, that you'd like to mention? Nothing else, or just Kim's just saying that the camera is a little bit blurry for me, um, for her. So hopefully the rest of you can see. I, my picture might be blurry, but as long as the slide deck's clear, that's, I guess, my main focus. So let me know if, if that's still a problem. So there's a few there. I'll keep moving through. Um, there's a couple others that have been really interesting in terms of, as I said, drones cleaning bathrooms, 
I know Sony's working on that. It's just some simple, really great innovations in terms of this little, um, I guess, attachment to your key ring. So instead of using your hand to open a door, a little pull ring um, being developed by this hands-free design co. So just really some clever innovations given our environment and the use of VR um, and RV in terms of creating virtual realities is um, progressing as well. And you can see the robots delivering food. So yeah, it, it is creating stuff. It may or may not be relevant for your business, but just thinking about the environment we're in and how you can leverage it, I think that's the key. So how do we do this? within our own business? How do we take this innovation? And it's always difficult um, in an environment where your cash flow might be stretched, but this is more of the reason why you need to do it. To really look at that business model, model canvas that we did last week. And the two elements that are really up for grabs or focus, if you like, is thinking about the environment or the trends that are coming through and looking at your value proposition and who you are targeting and making sure, as Ken said, in light of that SWOT analysis, are you actually leveraging the highest value um, for each of these at the moment? So what is it about the fit between your customer or perhaps the ideal customer might, may have changed? And in terms of the design of your product or service, what do you need to change? to make it more attractive. So there's some questions over here that I think are worth asking to try and help that innovation. And innovation doesn't have to be a whole new thing. It might just be a slight improvement that positions you much better um, than your competitors in what you have to offer. So things like, um, you know, are you looking at the scope of the problem that you're now solving? So say, for example, if we take um, WhatNot's product and we look at in terms of what the problem now is, um, you know, the average Joe Blow may have more of a need for, you know, the wipes, um, some of the other sort of products around, you know, cleaning. But if you take that particular value prop and look at the, say, for, for example, the wipes that you might have, and then actually apply it to a much larger segment. So it might be that, for example, childcare facilities that are now opening up have a larger demand for that. Then you're going to marry that product with a better consumer offering. So it's about looking at the problem you're solving, but also the audience that has the greater need, if you like. Um, and, that, and therefore the urgency of the issue. So you wanna try and um, pair those together to get the best bang for your buck. An example of this was um, Edible Beauty, which is the brand that I'm working at with at the moment doing their hand sanitizer. So, yeah, the, the general Joe Blow might want hand sanitizer, but who else needed that? You know, was it worthwhile almost putting that at every storefront in Chadston or within Sydney's major shopping centres for the shop owners to use so that the brand got out there? That would have been a really good augmentation of an urgent issue and a problem that they're solving that was a little bit out of the box, if you like. So it's sort of a looking for those opportunities, which was really a brand positioning exercise. Unfortunately, we didn't get there early enough. Hunter did, which is another brand that fits in that um, area. Um, but it would have been worth gifting that in terms of being able to um, share that product. So that's an example. Um, if there's a dramatic shift away from what you're addressing, then you need to question whether this is still going to be a fit going forward. And so, you know, that's when the deep dive begins. I mean, actually, have you still got a market given what's going on? Um, if you, are you sort of still looking to fill a need that's unmet 
or is the need now being met and it's or it's not an urgent need so all of these questions are worthwhile um, trying to think about so that you can um, achieve a better fit any questions on that it actually requires almost a bit of a brainstorm um, a bit of a workshop to look at the product suite or the service suite that you've got and see if there's something in it that would be um, able to address a new market or tweaking your product or service um, to an old market. I think what it does is it forces a reconsideration of the question, who is my customer? I think that's what you're saying. Mm. Um, and so there are now, or there could well be more potential customers than you thought before or different categories of customers. Yeah, exactly. And, and really is what you've got the highest value at the moment for your customer or have their lives changed so much that what you used to do for them isn't a priority? Well, what is and how can you be helpful and useful? Um, I think you know, it's gone from marketing, I've got this product to sell to what does my customer actually need? And the more you can turn it around that way, the more effective you'll be. Um, rather than push, it's sort of a pull strategy approach. And yeah, it's difficult if you've got a product out there, but now's the time to start thinking that way. A way to actually do that, it's, it's sort of like the business canvas for the customer. So before we did the business um, canvas for your business, but this is about looking at your customer and really doing this analysis. What jobs are they doing day to day? Your key customer. What are their issues and pains and what risks have they got and how do you solve that? Um, so this is all about looking at what your product or services is and what's the highest pain point or job that you can solve for them rather than the nice to haves because at the moment people are feeling needs more than wants. Not to say that they're not there but it's just an easier proposition. So if we look at the customer overall, there are sort of three segments to it. It's the jobs they have to do every day, day in, day out. And if you've got a product or service that fulfills that, then, you know, that's great. There's also the pains that they've got and how can you take that away? And then there's the things that are the gains. What are some nice wins that they can have because what you have, you know, really um, makes their life easier. So it's just a canvas that allows you to think about how to brainstorm um, that value proposition. And once you've looked at how do you pr provide greater value, either by a new um, market or augmenting your service or product, you can put it into this criteria. And I find that this is really useful. So if you've put your value proposition within that business model, then you should bring it over here and see do, how does it fare and maybe even, you know, ask a few different people to rank it so that you can see, is it a lukewarm value proposition? I mean, it'd be great to get a couple of your key clients to do this as well or at um, Edible Beauty, and I think we also did this at Pit & Cherry, we've got a group of gurus, I think there's 400 on our list, that we can go to that are the experts. And anything like this, if we're launching a new product or if we've got a question, we would get them to help us with this. Um, so is it single-minded? Is it benefit oriented? But how benefit oriented is and where is it really kicking goals and where is it, isn't it? Can we actually deliver it? Like, is it true? It'd be incredible how many people put value propositions up there, but they actually can't deliver on them. So that's really important. Is it believable, credible? Is it something you can get reviews on repeatedly? Is it unique? Does it actually have a point of difference? And if it's not unique, how are you going to market it? Is it substantive, relevant, and is it important to the target audience, which is why we did those slides before. If you've done that hard work, then it should pay off here, but you still need to test it. And does it reflect the most important competitive advantage for your business? Does it still stick 
with what you're known for and fit in with that. So there's just something that's worth doing after you've done that brainstorm to try and make sure that it fits in with, um, with what your audience wants. Is there any questions on that strategy? So I think that that's really important to go through. So, you know, this is all about what are the trends? How do I innovate? Um, how do I come up with something that just fits that sweet spot? This is worth doing in light of where we are at the moment to just recalibrate. We're now going to go on to um, how do we connect in this new environment from a digital perspective. And I'm going to look at not all of the digital touch points, but perhaps some key ones that I think are really important for this audience. Um, I really like this rule of thirds, which I spoke a little bit about last time, which is, you know, how often do you do different things? And the rule of thirds says, well, a third of the time, it's okay to promote your product or service. And I put a caveat on that if it's relevant to your audience. Um, and if it's relevant to the market. So last, last two weeks, a lot of industry stopped promoting their service and were much more about, um, you know, the, the black um, protests and their stance on that. There was very little um, about product promotion and that was sort of a given um, because of what was going on. And I'd say it would probably have been the same at the peak in, um, of the coronavirus, especially in the US and the UK, um, that there would have been a lot less of this promotion during that time. But generally, a third promoting your product or service in an engaged way, a third sharing something useful, not even about you, could be just something useful. You know, Ken does it all the time on LinkedIn in terms of um, sharing updated current information and then a third of it's just conversing doing something that's inactive interactive whether it's a poll whether it's a um, competition whether it's um, asking a question so that's the rule of thumb and it doesn't really matter which platform i think those rules apply so the question then becomes you know how do you know which of the different social media outlets you should be spending time on because you do end up having to spend time and it is a strategy um, so it needs to be something that you do over a, a period of time it's not something that you would get you know a result after three months it's really more a six months 12 months and then some so it's important to pick the right tools um, and I thought this was really important that you know people don't go on social media to buy something. They go on it to socialise. So a result of socialising and liking and loving and enjoying what you do um, makes them more inclined to buy what you sell or to engage with you and then perhaps use your service. But they certainly aren't there to be sold to. So there's a very fine line about how to use social. It's an important part of the mix and it's an important integrated part of the mix. Um, right now, we know about a third of traffic to your website's likely to come from social media if you're doing it well, sometimes more than that. But um, so it is an important part of being visible, but it's not the first per purchase platform. So the whole purpose of it then is this engagement to actually build your tribe, if you like, to strengthen your brand and what you stand for. It's, um, it can give you a platform and different platforms give you different elements of being able to do that. And again, to build traffic to, the, to your hub, which is usually a website. So before you pick the platform that you want to go on, you really need to do that profiling of who you're talking to um, and really understanding your customer and customers and where they are. And if you're not sure, how do you find them? Well, you know, starting with some of your competitors might be a way to see if they're on social, which social are they on. But 
I think you really need to understand your market first and foremost. So say, for example, if you were in um, real estate, you know, understanding which of the home buyers that you might be trying to sell with, is it Bridget who's trying to buy a home or is it Rita, the retiree? And they will be looking in different places for, for that service. So really understanding that. And there's a pro forma sheet within the um, resources on Teachable to help you do that. So once you've decided who it is you're talking to, then it's which platform. And you don't have to be on every one. In fact, there's no way you could. It's just so... Um, <laughs> There's just so many platforms, it would just be too labour intensive. In fact, probably one of the busiest sectors on SEEK is this social media digital marketer at the moment, you know, trying to get someone on three days a week to do this. Um, and I, I would say that that's quite a common um, ad that's out there. Certainly, I see it a lot. Um, so it, it is time intensive to do it right, especially the visual platforms. They almost require some graphic skill. So we'll look through that. But as I was saying before, you know, it's not unusual for this traffic, like 30% of your traffic to be coming from these platforms. So it's worth the investment as long as you're using it the right way. So let's have a look at a couple of them. Um, Instagram's really important for retail and any visual medium. So if you're um, visual at all, uh, this is something worthwhile being on. Um, it does have a high engagement rate, probably higher than some of the others. And being a visual me medium, people like to like pictures that they see. Below, I've just got an example of um, what we've been doing with Edible Beauty. And... Look, an image can tell a thousand words, but it's also about representing, I guess, what you stand for and your products and actual visual images of the product in use and tidbits, but it's also about curating beautiful images. And some of this takes a lot of energy. Um, not all of the images, you know, are you going to have footage of every product but it's about curating images that fit in with your brand and more importantly your tribe and so um yeah this is really popular with um you know that millennials but it's also popular with people that follow certain categories health um in terms of beauty cosmetics obviously um music um any visual medium um, and artistry is, is really important to be. Uh, Danielle, I was with a client this week and they, they're they sort of in the lotions and potions categories and the, they their, their products are generally um, wild sort of colours. So I've got a face mask in front of me, which is bright purple. So when you put it on, you know, it's purple, but it's an Instagrammable message. People put that sort of stuff up and that and that's what attracts attention. So you often don't even think of that. You think, oh, my, you know, my product needs to look nice and creamy like a lotion or something like that. But these guys actually pick colours that are a bit out there because millennials, you know, like to take selfies and put them on Instagram. And so it's, yeah. it's, it's the colour is something which is quite dynamic and appealing, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And look, Instagram or whatever platform that you may choose to engage with, it's part of your overall strategy. And that could change. Like particularly retail, it's so driven by the um, calendar of what's happening and, um, you know, by Instagrammable moments, it's, it is really driven by the heartbeat of what's going on. So, you can have that by what you're doing in your business and, and build out a theme and keep to that theme and that makes the, you know, the customer more engaged. Um, but you can also do it by what's going on in society. And, and so a bit of a mix is, is, is something that we sort of advise. But that's a, yeah, that's a perfect example. Um, Pinterest is another uh, fantastic platform for visual are any of you on Pinterest at the moment? 
if you want to put your hand up, if you are. Um, look, this is undervalued in my opinion and that's fantastic for me <laughs> because right now I'm using Pinterest for another business that I run, which is a beading business. But, you know, I'm getting, as you can see, almost 2,000 2, views a month on Pinterest. It is a fantastic platform for people who are seeking out something. They're trying to curate something. Um, again, in, um, in fashion, in retail, even construction, doing flip books, um, trying to collect and collate ideas. This is a great um, platform for many of those. So, yeah, I've had some good success through Pinterest. It, it definitely is attracting more a female bend, although that's changing. But it's a really great one to drive traffic back to your website on products, especially if it fits in a niche, which most products do. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that and have a look at their analytics and, you know, you can always download. They've got an information booklet on how to use it. But it's also a very affordable um, platform for advertising to specific niches as well, much like Facebook. And now um, we know that we can do that through LinkedIn as well. So it's a good option um, for some. It's worth having a look at in more detail. Um, Facebook, as we know, and we know that, you know, people are spending time on this every day um, to connect with family and friends. Um, but I also think one of the best things about Facebook is the way that you can pinpoint your audience. Um, I know that with Edible Beauty, our spend on Facebook now equals our Google because it's just so targeted. And in fact, I think dollar per spend, it's somewhere about around about the $8 to $1 spend. So we get $8 back for every $1 we spend on Facebook. And I think it's a little bit less on Google AdWords. So, you know, we can do that all day, every day when we're getting that result. And that's purely based on being very, very targeted. Um, and, and what I mean by that is absolutely identifying those, that ideal customer in the right location with the product that we um, know they'll need. And with Facebook, we do retargeting. So we go back to the people that have visited our website and target them again on Facebook. So just again, that integrated program of following our um, user across different platforms um, and being consistent. So that's Facebook. I guess the last one in depth that I wanted to talk about was LinkedIn. Um, definitely for B2B, um, but also B2C in terms of having that company profile for collaboration. Um, but for B2B, it's really important um, because, you know, everyone's got those spammy um, requests for connection. And that's probably the downfall of it. And people think, well, I won't use it because of that. But in terms of actually using it for leveraging your authority with content and building that out, connecting with industry organisations, um, recruitment, building sales lists. If any of you have got the Navigator, um, uh, Navigator membership, that also allows you to identify different groups of people at different levels, much like Facebook, but more from a business perspective. It also now allows you to retarget. Um, they've introduced new webinars on LinkedIn so that you can actually do in personal events. So that's sort of, I guess, similar to Zoom, um, but they're trying to also compete with Google in being able to operate and do that. And in, in terms of that, there's some really specific features that they're um, enabling, which is, you know, worth going into, but it would take a long time, but it, it, it is another sales opportunity to get across um, 
different categories with your message. So I think that that's really worthwhile. I um, mean, you can see some of the, the um, stats down below in terms of, you know, where it really hits its own, um, particularly as a B2B tool. So um, it's something worthwhile looking. I can't exactly give you the return per dollar spend on ads. I was doing some last year um, and we definitely got results from them. But I think it's more of a long term authority based tool rather than a specific lead generation tool. Um, so, yeah, I think you all should definitely have a, pro, a profile at a company level. And the other reason you want it at a company level is you want to make sure that all of your employees follow you. Um, and that just gives them, a, 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 I guess, a streamlined um, identity with your company. So that's definitely worth doing, if nothing else. Um, I wanted to touch on influencer relationships because this is becoming more and more um, relevant, uh, particularly in retail space. Have any of you um, invested in influencer relationships? If you want to put your hand up, you can just use the button. Yeah, okay. Yep, okay, so three or four of you have. Awesome. How many of you have done paid influencer relationships? So as opposed, okay, so Ryan and Alison, you have. Maybe if one of you or, or all of you just want to chat about um, have you noticed anything changing in relation to that paid spend of, of an influencer relationship or want to explain how that's worked for you? Hi, everyone. It's Ryan here from the Black Group. How are you? Well, thanks, Ryan. Can you tell us about your business a little bit and then how you've used Yep, so we are the Black Group. We own three um, brands. One is called Black, which is charcoal skincare. One is called Generation Clay, which is Australian botanical skincare. Mm -hmm. And then we have a another range called Flight Mode, which is travel inspired skincare, high hydration skincare. Yeah. Right. Um, so we used to use influencers for paid ads um, like as a once-off thing, but we found that over time customers don't um, don't connect or engage with that anymore because they know that it's a paid post and they don't believe it. Yeah. So that used to work for us, but it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that we've done. We launched Flight Mode with a big marketing campaign. We took a pri two private jets from LA out to a resort called Amangiri mm -hmm. with all the Victoria's Secret supermodels and that got lots of press coverage for us so that was very successful mm -hmm. and then we that was very expensive though yes. <laughs> um, then we also have done another couple of campaigns where rather than using the influencer as a once-off we have engaged them as like a, a ambassador yeah so they've done multiple posts, multiple Instagram stories, and they have received a coupon code, which they receive a commission on the sales that they bring in through that coupon code. And that has been more engaging for the customer rather than just a once-off post. So that's what we've been doing. Yeah. Awesome. Um, did anyone else want to give an example? Thanks, Ryan. That was really worthwhile. So what we're finding is you know, consumers are so smart. They know when something's paid. And exactly to your point, Ryan, I've discouraged the payment of individuals um, and really tried to um, pick a few ambassadors that we might work with that actually represent our brand and actually get what we're doing, are aligned with it, if you like. And it would make sense for them to be the ambassador. And, um, you know, nothing works better than somebody saying, I'm not getting paid for this, but I believe in it. And so we've also reached out to people with Edible Beauty that we just want to gift some of the products, whether they use them or not. Um, 
that we really believe fit with what you know their um, ideology is and so doing that is really important um, I think the time of doing uh, you know paid influences without linking it to a longer term objective are over um, and so you know rather than just trying to um, do a campaign for campaign's sake we really want to build authenticity because um, have many of you heard of Bon Appetit and what's happened in the last week or so? I think some of you, I've got your hands still up, so I'll put them down. But yeah, any of you have heard of Bon Appetit? So you may not have. Bon Appetit's an online um, uh, magazine sort of that, um, they curate and critique uh, food outlets. They're sort of foodies, if you like. They're the go-to. Um, they have a lot of staff that, that write about it. Anyway, the CEO um, was seen to do something during um, the last two weeks that basically said we support um, you know, the, the riots in terms of we support that Black Lives Matter. And what happened after that she did this is some of her staff, um, and one person in particular, found uh, an image of her which was discrediting um, that ideology. And also that started a fireball response to other staff saying, um, that they were of colour and were paid differently, they weren't given the same experiences in training, et cetera, et cetera. And so this just set off a landslide issue for Bon Appetit in terms of, you know, what they were espousing didn't actually reflect what was happening. And so this is a problem um, more so with, more so with, um, sorry about that, issues related to, you know, joining a uh, some sort of relationship um, that's in the public eye, but also in social media, that you really have to pick those relationships that relate to your ideology, um, because what can happen with Bon Appetit, and you can probably mention lots of others, is you will be found out. And to win back that trust. And as you can see, if you ever go onto their Insta file now or Twitter or whatever, you'll see lengthy apologies from um, the CEO and others trying to recoup what I think is going to be untenable for her in that role. So it can be really powerful, but it can be really damaging if you get it wrong. So authentic, um, making sure that you're building that in um, a way that's got an ongoing relationship um, is really important, like Ryan said. So I thought that was important to sort of just announce, but just bringing it back now to another sort of social, um, and I guess this could be true for email campaigns or for SMS campaigns, which are becoming more and more important. Um, just a little hands up, any of you using SMS at the moment? campaigns just to trigger. No, so no one's using SMS. I imagine a lot of you are using email. Yeah, so um, at the moment, email for, from the perspective of growing your business is not just, I guess, one type of email. I think up until now, a lot of businesses have been doing what we call that email blast, where they send something to their entire list. Um, and we know that that's not as effective as it perhaps once was with the volumes that we're all getting. So there's sort of two types of email marketing that I think is important to talk about in this whole sphere of contact and social and um, content marketing and that is email nurturing where you actually look at an individual across um, their journey with you 
and build out some campaigns that are relevant to them. And then there's the other type of email, which is perhaps, you know, the newsletter once a month or the follow-up after a um, transaction or if in B2B, it might be the quarterly update with a few case studies. And I think that what has become more apparent is this combination of a theme-based nurture, but also, I'll show you as we go through, even trying to bring that down to one-to-one -to -one, um, email so that the email is based on the knowledge that you know about the individual. So um, any hands up in terms of how many of you are doing this email nurturing at the moment that is following the journey of the individual? Are any of you doing that? No hands going up, but I can't believe that you wouldn't be. <laughs> so no one's doing email nurturing at all? Okay. Maybe they're doing it, but they don't call it the... Oh, Sinead is, yeah. So maybe, so if you're doing any sort of... Sinead, do you want to explain what you're doing? And then others... I'll, I'll just let Frankie speak. She's our marketing manager. Okay, great. Thanks, Frankie. Yeah, so we... Um try to see what our where our customers for example drop off um, when they visit our uh, website so yeah. what makes them leave um, at what point we try to follow up with say oh you didn't you left the uh, cart uh, why was that um, can we help you with say uh, a percentage off or we offer free shipping or something like what was the reason yeah. So, yeah, we try to follow them when they go through the shopping uh, on the page. Um, yeah. We also try to figure out whether there are certain topics that they find interesting, like is it ingredients, and then we write a post on ingredients, yeah. um, and then we or a blog, and then we send emails out with the blog, um, and then we follow up a week later. Or have you read it? And okay. here's a percentage off. Say if it maximizes the topic, then we follow up with a um free lotion for every sale of yada yada and then they get that so just so it kind of keeps them engaged and um yeah we follow topics that are interesting interesting for them yeah fantastic and i i guess that uh you using like um clavio or what what yeah software? yeah Clavio. Clavio. yeah any others of you using clavio or something similar to that to um, do yep ryan you are okay so building out that sort of um email nurturing is really important it can make a big difference to your marketing and i think that best practice now is even trying to do it one-on-one -on -one. i heard a podcast last week of the owner of um, adore beauty which is a um a website that sells all different sorts of beauty products has spent I think just over the million dollars Aussie to get um, more personalized catchment of data so that then she can make that journey even more one-on-one -on -one for each person so beyond perhaps what Clavio might be doing or Shopify or, or other um, tools that you know, we might be able to use some sort of segmentation. Um, and I might actually just, I might just escape this for a second and show you. Let me just see if I can. Um, I just wanted to show you one second. Just miss and share this. So let me just go in here for a minute. Because I think if you see it, it'll make a bit of difference. So I'm just going into the back of Clavio, which is um, edible beauty site. But I just want to show you so that you can, I think some of you are doing some of this, but this might actually help um, you see the opportunity if you like. So in Clavio, and it wouldn't matter if it was um, you know, MailChimp or whatever you're using, um, but in Clavio, they've got two different types of uh, campaigns. One is a campaign, and that's a one-off sort of sales promotion. You can see here 
um, this is the name of the campaign, this is how many people it was sent to and how many have opened it and the click through rate. And when they've placed an order, we can also get that information there. So there's various campaigns that might be sent to various lists. When you go into the flows, which is more of the drip type that um, you were referring to, Frankie, there's some in here that are automated and I imagine that you've got one like the abandoned cart. So if somebody goes to check out, and I'm sure you're doing this as well, Ryan, if they don't, you then um, set up a flow that says, if, the, if you wait an hour, we'll go back and offer you something, for example. And then if you don't, after two days, we might offer you something else, an example might be. So that's sort of becoming fairly common um, within the tools and, and a lot of the tools actually have that set up so that it's, it's sort of almost a plug and play template, if you like. What they don't have and what I wanted to show you next is something that takes it to the next level. And when you've done um, the research on your customers, this is where it's going. So Adore Beauty is spending a million bucks, but we can do it in different ways. And I'm going to show you how to do that in the next section. Um, let me just save out of this. And I'll, I might show you the flow first and then I'll go back and show you the how. So in here, we have a flow called skincare. I think, I hope. Yeah. Well, this is in the US actually. I might just log into the Australian side. Just go back in to here. Um, palm trees. I think it's just worth showing you this because if, depending on how sophisticated you are within this tool, this might take it to the next level and it might allow you um, to develop more. So campaigns day to day, flows more that ongoing journey if you like, um, how to make those flows even more valuable, take the initial ones of they've abandoned the car, we'll chase them up. They haven't answered anything for a long time. They haven't clicked on anything. They haven't been on our website. They haven't engaged in social. Maybe we'll give them one more offer and then we'll unsubscribe them so we're not wasting money. Um, but the longer term play is to actually have a way of segmenting your audience so that you can send them the right offer at just the right time. And so how do you do that? So we developed a skincare quiz. For you guys, it might be something similar um, to be able to segment our audience. I'm gonna show you how we did this, but just to give you an example of the sort of segmentation that you can do once you've um, got that sort of level of detail is that we can then um, create flows based on any criteria. So within this particular survey, we asked them about their skin routine and this particular group were acne prone. So we asked them what sort of skin type they had. This group, just this particular group had, had acne, but within acne, um, there were different levels, if you like. And so each of these different levels got a different offer. And so um, you can see how it can feel more personal and it is more personal but it's based on asking the right questions, if you like. So I just wanted to give you an example that's because when we go back to the slide deck, I'm gonna show you how you can create better forms to get better segmentation, to get a better result within your marketing. Does that make sense? Danielle, it might be worth asking, do they actually all segment their markets? Yeah, perhaps I can go back and ask that question. I think we've got a couple of questions. Um, uh, anyone want to share their experience on that in terms of, um, you know, segmenting your market? Just open the chat function. Anyone want to give an example? And do they? Well, perhaps even if you put your hands up, if you are segmenting your market at the moment. Hi there, it's Ryan again. Yeah. 
Um, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, we have found that with Clavio, the abandoned cart system isn't that great. Yeah. There is another system called, um, what is it called? I'm having a mental blank, but I'll let okay. you know. <laughs> I will let you guys know what it is. Um, but what it does is when you add, the customer adds something to their cart, it forces them to put their email in. Yeah. So it captures it before anything else, which Clavio can't do. Yes. Um, the, it's called Recart, recart.com. So the good thing about that is that they force the customer to put in their email when they add it to the cart. And then if they leave the cart, that we've already got their email. Whereas Clavio only captures it sometimes when they type in their email into the shopping cart. Sometimes it collects it, sometimes it doesn't. Whereas Recart forces the customer to type their email in first and then it copies it to the cart so they don't have to type it again. Yeah. But you get their email every time. And then you can also SMS them. You can send them an abandoned cart series through that software or you can send them a message on Facebook Messenger to bring them back. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, Ryan. That's okay. That makes, do you actually segment your audience that come through? We haven't really started using Clavio yet because we've only just brought on our e-commerce manager. We didn't have one before because we're very focused on Amazon in America, which doesn't need any of that. Um, but we have got Clavio, all our emails are in there and we're about to start using it. So we will see the effects of that over the next couple of weeks. And I don't know if Pip is on this call, but she will watch the recording and then maybe we can get some advice from you about what segmentation and campaigns do and don't work. Yeah, awesome. She is on this call, so, so that's great. Um, well, look, uh, uh, we'll go into segmentation a bit more, but it doesn't really matter whether you're using Clavio or not, or any tool that you're using. Being able to talk one-to-one -one is where it's at, and that's what customers expect. So how do we do that? I agree, Ryan, like some of the automation flows are a little, leave a little bit to be desired, but they're better than not doing anything. And certainly that red card is something to take um, away and have a look at. Um, so let's just keep moving. I, just before we go and look at well, what form could you create to do the segmentation, whether you're using Clavio or something else? I just wanted to have a look at the cost of content. So the cost of content, you know, some people say, well, I'm just going to use advertising or I'm just going to do social. Really, honestly, what's worked most effectively for the majority of clients is a mix. It's always a mix. And... The thing about content is it's always going to be on your website. You're always going to have a link to it. It's something you can repurpose in a number of ways. So the cost of content sometimes can be a little bit frightening up front because you might think, well, I can do X many ads for that. But remember, you own it at the end of the day. So it's worth the investment. I just think it's worth you understanding what that is, you know, how much does a copywriter cost? How much does the average blog cost? And that includes that you're going to get keywords like we've seen on Neil Patel or AREFs or SEMrush, that it's going to rank and it should do its job like an ad does in terms of you being found. Um, you know, there's sometimes you have to go and buy images, but there's also other sites where you can get images for free. So I'll give you these um, slides and you can click into this link and it'll give you more of a breakdown. Um, but it's, you know, it's certainly not a free thing, even if you're creating the content nowadays, actually having it ranked so that it's found and searchable is key, but so is making sure that when it's actually used, You've got alt tags in your images. There's a whole process around it. Um, but it is definitely part of that online digital footprint and your authority, particularly with B2B. Can I jump in quickly? Go for it. 
Yep. I have an amazing copywriter. Her name um, I don't have on the top of my head, but she writes all the copy for our blogs and for our product packaging. Um, she charges something like five Hong Kong dollars per word and she's really amazing at what she does. It's very engaging for the consumer and things like that. So if anyone would like the details of hers, I'm happy to share that. Her name is Bridget. Right. Um, also oh, if you give them to me, I'll 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 give them to Danielle. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ken. Also, I have just sent Ken an opportunity for any other beauty brands. So what we do at the Black Group with our brands is we supply all the products to the beauty boxes in America and in Europe. So they have brand, they have placements from five from three hundred thousand units all the way up to two million units, um, and we are starting to offer brands in Australia the opportunity to go into those beauty boxes. Um, it's full size or sample size. It has to be engaging for the consumer um, mm -hmm. visually because the brands and the beauty boxes like the retagging and the reposting. Um, the benefits of this is that you literally get someone tagging you in a selfie every 30 seconds to one minute when you do these campaigns. So you get a huge amount of self-generated content from the consumer and then also, these brands do massive campaigns around the brand. So some of our brands have been on TV adverts with FabFitFun in America, which would have cost us thousands of dollars to do, which we didn't have to pay for. And our products have even been on billboards in Times Square, which is amazing because we can't afford to do that. But the beauty boxes do this for us. So... Um, obviously, it costs a lot of money to produce these sample sizes and the full size products. So the brands would need to license their formula to us. Otherwise, we can reverse engineer your formula and get it to the beauty boxes. It's dependent on the beauty boxes if they like the product, whether it's accepted. So Ken's going to send out an email that has a, a list of requirements and things like that. Um, it really just depends whether the brand, uh, the beauty box likes the product and then we can produce the product for you. We'll send you the samples. You can decide if you are happy with the sample and then we will produce it either in China or Australia. There is one caveat to it is that we will, we are very good at marketing our products on Amazon in America. We have a third party company that does that for us. If we were to place your beauty products and bankroll the production of the product into the beauty box, we would look at a minimum of two year distribution of your product on Amazon in America. And we would discuss the margins around that with you. Um, but yeah, that's a great way to get copy. I mean, sorry, to get images and tags on Instagram. Um, as I said, a massive coverage. Ken has a document as well from FabFitFun about a, a partnership that we did with our Purple Clay Mask for 1.8 million units full size. Um, as I said, it was on TV in America for free. It was on billboards in Times Square, all that kind of stuff. Massive, massive coverage. Everyone knows who we are in America now because of that brand placement. Right, right. I'll, Ryan, I'll um, look. I, once we sort that document out, because mm -hmm. I think we need to do a few more things. But I'm happy to give it to Danielle, and she can circulate it if anyone's interested in talking to you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for that. And yeah, the copywriter is always good. <laughs> always good. You can never have enough copywriters. So those details to Kim would be great as well. Thank you. Um, so moving on, I guess the next section that um, helps my clients is to try and have a content planner that has everything that you're going to do within one screen. So that if you've got a theme for the month or you know something's coming up, that you can see an overview. I mean, even in Clavio now, you can have little pop-ups or they call them fly-outs that you can have that are targeted to one particular audience. So say, for example, you were going to do um, a product uh, for mature skin 
you could have everyone that's in your database if you've asked that question that are over a certain age if they visit your website that that little flyer just shows to them so within this planner you might have a campaign for dry skin or mature skin you might have an email campaign going out you might have um, you know a, a blog post on it you might also have a fly out and if you've got an sms but actually having all of the things joining up that's when you get the best effect advertising social email um, influencer pr the whole bit so to be able to put it in a planner and to try and get six weeks ahead is really important normally when i start with clients they they don't have one and then as we go forward, I'll try and get six weeks ahead and can generally get there after a couple of months. And that gets you into the rhythm of being able to leverage other things um, like the beauty box that Ryan talks about because you've got enough time to plan it. Um, how many of you use some sort of planning device like a calendar for all of your content changes? Yeah, Alison, you do. Do you mind? Um, or um, Pippa, you do. Alison, what do you use? Do you mind sort of letting us know? So we have, uh, because we cover so many brands, uh, we need to make sure obviously that we are giving the appropriate time to, to those brands yeah. and that they are relevant uh, in terms of, you know, what is happening in the market at that stage. So. Um, it is a uh, sort of an online uh, calendar that is available to the uh, sales and marketing team. Yeah. Um, and uh, exactly that. It sort of gives us pop-ups as to sort of, you know, what is happening when, sort of what our deadlines are, um, and it allows us to, to plan in advance. Yeah. Is it an actual particular software or...? Uh, no, it's just something that we've created um, in-house. Oh, excellent. So it's actually custom. We've customised it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, did you put your hand up too? Do you use something? Oh, oh, let me see if I can... Pippa did. Oh, Pippa? Oh, I thought Andrew did as well. Okay, Pippa, do you want to talk about what you use or what you're planning yeah, to use? Yeah, hi. So, um... I'm only second week into my um, role at um, the Black Group. Um, and the first thing I did was sit down and try and start my calendar. Um, obviously, I've still got a lot of work to do on it being new. Um, but for me, um, even just in my past experience, a calendar is key <laughs> to just keeping on top of everything and planning ahead. Um, I'm pretty simple. I've just used Excel um, so far. But if there's any programs or anything you can recommend, then I'd be interested in hearing about that. Yes, look, there are. Um, there's actually quite a few, so I'll I'll get them to everyone afterwards. Um, I'm a, I'm always evaluating them. Um, some are better for marketing. Some are great for social. Um, you know, there's lots of social scheduling tools like Hootsuite and and Sprout Social, but they don't necessarily take into account um, you know all the other elements. So let me get back to the group. I mean, I've attached um, a calendar example like this one in um, the Teachable section for this, but I will come back to you on some um, software because I actually think that even though we're doing these in, let's say, Excel or this, and we put it in the Google Drive or Dropbox for other people to update, there is still that element <laughs> that something gets f forgotten or it's not updated. So that I am really investigating the software angle because I think ultimately um, just being able to go back and look at what was successful, actually have it in a software platform will leverage some other benefits, but certainly having something is better than nothing. So that's great Pip, that you've done that straight away. Um, I just wanted to, before I move on to the forms that I was talking about that I want to do in the last section, this is, um, this is an example or just a slide that I found that talks about, you know, 
what to use in what format, you know, in terms of organic and reach, what formats can be used and, um, you know, the conversion of what you could do in terms of call to action. I just thought that this was quite an interesting slide to have a look at, just to check, um, you know, what connections you could be using. It's sort of like a little bit of a snapshot. So, um, yeah, that'll be in the slide deck just in case you want to go through it. I won't go through it now, but it's a sort of an overall catch-all, if you like. Um, the, the call to actions for this in terms of the digital profile, I'm not going to go through now, but I will leave it um, for you to have a look at and just make sure that there's some of the things that you can do um, to make sure that your digital profile is working the best for you across different platforms. Um, in terms of doubling down, I thought this was quite an important point that what we can see in some of the research is a lot of people have reduced their spend in, in lots of areas. So this is sometimes the opportunity for you to pick an area and, um, and really double down on that so that you will get not only a better value, but probably better cut through. If, especially if your competitors aren't doing the spend. So it's something to plan out in terms of where you put um, the dollar spend, but it's also a time that's not just around spend, it's also about you know, emphasising your brand and where do you do that? Where can you really show empathy and stand out? An example of that was you know, Aldi being one of the first to help vulnerable um, uh, senior citizens, etc., with special opening hours. Is there something that you can do that will emphasise just to one particular audience um, how you can help them? And it might make a bigger impact than trying to be everything to everyone. Did someone have a question or a thought process in? No? Okay. Um, so I think that, yeah, a lot of people are at home. We're online much more than we were. So staying connected with the audience, um, don't drop that off if anything. You know, we know that retail's had, you know, 130% increase online over the last two months, even though that's starting to change now. And that's largely because we're online. Um, so I think... If, if you're in really hard times, this might be the time to show your customer base some love. So especially towards the end of this financial year, there might be opportunities to um, help your customers by invoicing now um, services that they then get after June 30th. So that for a B2B could be something worthwhile um, putting out to your customer base. Um, I think the key thing is, you know, not to do something in a knee-jerk reaction because we know that over time it's consistency that's going to make the difference for your marketing. Um, but even taking the time to look at how do you skill up, how do you um, learn more about your customers, that's the time for doing that in a downturn is now or if you know if all things are you know you're in the travel business and you can't do anything there's still things that you can be doing in marketing this is a really good academy down the bottom blogging for business i know we spoke a little bit about content it's a free academy at the moment and rhrefs much like neil patel is my go-to for um, lots of things so that might be worthwhile having a look at as well and you know if there's someone on your team that's responsible for content, it'd be worthwhile having a look at that. Um, again, I'll send you these slides afterwards. You don't have to take it all down. Um, I just wanted to sort of end this session by thinking about how do we find out more about uh, if you can. customers? Was there a question? Oh, it might just have been somebody having a, a chat. So finding out more about your customers can happen in lots of ways. But I want to show you a few examples that I've done in the last 
couple of weeks, if you like. Let me just um, stop share for a second and I'll just go into another screen and show you. Sorry, I'll just go into this screen and share this screen for a second. Oops. Sorry, I'll just try and get it back onto here. Let's escape out of this. Okay. Um, you share. Let's just go into this one. All right. Should be all right. Let's just take a bit of time to. Oh, no, it's still on that. Sorry. Just have to try and um, escape it to get it smaller. Okay, there we go. Let me go back into here and just into this one. So I use um, Typeform to do a lot of forms um, at the moment. Have any of you used Typeform before or something similar? Yep, Ryan has. So I find I've used just about every form builder there is. <laughs> Wufu, MailChimp, SurveyMonkey, you name it, JotForm. What I really like about Typeform is it's just a nice, it's like using an Apple as opposed to, or a Mac as opposed to using a PC. It's just got really nice design ability and it integrates very well. Um, so what I was saying before about this skin quiz and then ultimately what comes from that is lots of different promotions. It actually originated um, on, in the type form, but let me just show you um, in the website so you can see. So each of you was saying, some of you um, segment, some of you are starting to segment. It's a really big trend. You'll, you'll see it through every industry, not just retail, but also in commercial space. And so what we've noticed, particularly in the skincare beauty space is that people want something that's just for them. And so it is a big part of um, Edible Beauty's brand to do that. And so we've created a couple of different quizzes. Um, and obviously this gives some information to different um, clients, but it also provides us with those segmentation points that we can then build into Clavio. And so as I just show you this example, you might be able to think about what are the questions you need to be asking of your customers' potential prospects that give them, obviously, some knowledge, but also give you the opportunity to segment? So the first one that we did was this, um, well, we actually did a couple. We've got one in here, I think, because this is the old website. It may not be in here. We've got one on skin type because, obviously, the sort of skin that you have um, influences the products. But we've also got one more on habits. And I think this one here is going to be the one that's more on habits. And so what we did within Typeform, you can see we've got all of these different ones in here now. We've got one for inner wellness, which is our new products. Um, but the one that we're talking about now is um, this general one. We've done one before we, we tested one, before we put on the web to over a thousand people. So we know that there's a need for it. The other thing is to always do one and see on social, share it on social and see if people fill it in and get some feedback before you launch it on your site, which is what we did. But ultimately what it does is it asks some questions and these questions then become the filter. So what we were trying to do is work out well, how much of our audience, and we did this to our database, is all of these things? How many are a new person, know nothing about skincare? Because if 70% of the people on our list actually don't know that much, then we need to change our messaging. Um, what we did find out is over 400 people know a hell of a lot more about skincare probably than we do, and so that changes how we talk to them and how we use them. 
most of them sit in this space or this space. So they're either very passionate about skincare and trying things new or are sort of naturally curious about it. They might have some hit and misses, you know, that that's where they sit. So they fill this out and then we ask the question, you know, what's their major concern and they can choose more than one of these. Well, for me, it was, you know, dark circles, fine lines. I could fill them all in. <laughs> so obviously you can see that those criteria would then be how we could segment and send things based on these criteria to our customers. Um, what sort of skin do you have? Again, that could be used to send information. What age are you? Again, used to send information. This was an interesting one and it might be relevant for some of you that have got organic um, products is, you know, how much currently do you buy that is organic? And we could have said skincare, but we could have equally have said products here um, because it's giving us the information about our customer base. So we fill that in. Um, we knew that skin was more about the topical, um, especially with this brand, it's more about holistic. So we started to ask some questions about that in terms of stress, where do you sit on that scale? In terms of sleep, where do you sit on that scale? Again, if we've got products that are going to address, you know, sleep deprivation or, or, or vitamins that address that, we then have that information to take forward. How much do you drink? Again, the moisture in the skin, um, your lifestyle. Like if you work outdoors, for example, you know, then we want to know about that from a sun protection point of view, whether you're pregnant so that we can actually, or wanting to get pregnant or breastfeeding, that, that also can set up a, a trigger or a flow. Whether you smoke, um, so that can set up a flow, et cetera, et cetera. So you go through all of these um, various ones and you come out the end. I'll just do this quickly. So it was about, you know, so if they say in here, do you, they were outdoors, but they don't wear sunscreen, then that can automatically send out a trigger to them to say the risks involved with it and why they should and an offer on that sunscreen. So you can sort of see how this segmentation is just so fantastic. And what you'll find is a lot of skincare, um, beauty in that space are starting to do something, perhaps not as intense as this. A lot of them do, what skin type are you? But, and look, we haven't got this front and centre of our site because we know it's, you know, going to take a few minutes to fill in. But we've had over a thousand people fill this in. And so we can then be very deliberate about, you know, how we um, cater for that going forward. And it is on all of our flows, um, you know, everything from what they prefer in terms of a discount sample or suggest your own. So it gives us a lot of information. Um, and at the end of it, it gives us, um, and we even ask about misinformation. So I'm not going to answer that there, but I'll just show you. This took a long time to develop and a lot of testing as well. And we're still refining it. Um, and so what happens at the end of this is we get some recommendations sent to them based on that survey. Um, and we also give them a special discount. Um, but what happens as soon as they finish that is we have a look and if they've got dry skin with this and this, they go into one flow. If they're a certain age, they go into another flow. Um, and so that form becomes very important. And as I said, we've done it for a number of different um, objectives or strategies, if you like. Um, we've also done one that's a little bit more about social. This one's more about um, a bit of fun. Um, but it also collects some information about them and, and keeps it sort of a bit trendy, if you like, being on brand um, and then filters through, you know, a bit of a challenge to see because we know the people on our side are really proactive and want to know. They want to know what's in the ingredients. They know. They look up things to find out what's in what because we know what they're like. Um, 
any questions on that or any participants that have done something like that or are looking to do something like that? Any of you currently do anything other than just a basic form, contact form on your site? Not yet. So look, hopefully you can see that having the opportunity to adjust even just your contact form. I mean, even if you just had on your contact form a question, what skin type are you? Or if you're a B2B, what industry are you? It just gives you a chance immediately to be a little bit more segmented and to really show a bit more value to those people. Um, I've done another one for a, a vitamin company that assesses how fit you are and then recommends various supplements. So it's just a matter of thinking about what do you need to know to give better advice to your clients and could you put that in a simple form that would give them something at the end but would give you so much information that you could use. Um, and as I said, we've got this on the website, but you could easily do this through social. You could do it through an ad. You could do it through a push. Um, so hopefully that's giving you some information about how to use forms and how powerful they are for segmentation. Um, so if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer that. Or otherwise, I will go to the last slide. Because I know we're over time and I hate being over time. <laughs> um, so let me just bring this up to full so we can all see it. So hopefully that's giving you some background on, I guess, the trends that we're seeing come through because of COVID and the nature that it is. It gives you a chance to do a deep dive back into particularly your customer segment the most attractive you want at the moment, given the environment, and look again at your product and service and what really is the best fit. Um, I'm hoping that it's giving you some information about how um, to digitally connect and perhaps what are the best platforms for your audience and don't try and do everything, do some things well. Um, there's some key actions that I'll send with this slide set that you can have a look at that you might want to just tick off. Um, I'll look up that software for creating your own calendar in case you want to do that. But again, in the Teachable Tools, there's a download one you can use. And the next webinar is going to be really interesting. Um, what I've decided to do is there's a lot less slides, <laughs> which is good. But I've also got two guest speakers coming in to take you through what they've done in a content from a copywriter and from a designer in terms of how to make, um, how to utilise your customer list and how to build trust with some case studies. So it'll be a lot less of me talking, but actually to see something go from start to finish. Um, and we're going to look at two, um, one a B2B and one a retail. So hopefully you found this useful. I know that we will follow up with an email and it'd be great to have some feedback in a in the survey that we send out just so that we can improve these each time and try and make them more interactive. Um, Ken, have you got any comments to share? Uh, look, I just think um, everybody should check them out and get a bigger toolkit because I think Danielle's given you so many new tools. It's been pretty amazing. And one of the problems in business is, is that you don't have, people don't have time to actually look out for all of these things. And so to have somebody who's out there almost as your search agent finding things for you. Excuse me. I think that's um, pretty amazing. And I think uh, you all should be very grateful for that. I'm sure you are. And for the insights that, that Danielle has provided today. So thank you again for attending. Uh, look, Dan, it might be worth um, Ryan and Pippa staying on for a little bit so you can show them what Teachable is because they probably don't know or anybody else who wants to sure. hang, hang on. But um, otherwise, everybody else can go and... We will see you next week. See you next week. Thank you. No problem. <laughs>